I'm going to be reading this morning from 1 John. It's one of those little books right before Revelation. 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 through 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. I ask that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us grace as we look into your word this morning. Lord, we cannot help but thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, that offers peace with God. Lord, help us as we look at your word this morning. May your word speak loud and clear to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I I have a mild request this morning, and that is simply that uh, you don't mistake my passion for having arrived, nor my zeal for judgment. But like Paul says in Philippians 3, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Although this text seems rather innocuous, it is anything but, and there is much at stake for us to understand what John is telling us. The proposition this morning is that there's two approaches to loving God. Two approaches to loving God. The first approach, quite simply, is saying it. The first approach is saying it. We see that right here at the beginning of our text. Verse 20. If anyone says, I love God. Have you ever heard someone say this? I suspect you have. I suspect you've probably been among those who have said it, or at the very least, I suspect you've thought it. It's actually quite easy to say. You could try it if you want. I love God. Three little words. It's easy to say not just because the words are small and easy to pronounce, but it's easy to say because you can mean so many different things by it. And in fact, that is exactly what happens. The first question that we should be asking ourselves is what is love? Not in the 70s disco song, but nevertheless, we should be asking what is love? Apparently, in the first century AD, this word love was prone to the same misconceptions that we see today. Uh, Apparently people used it in the same sort of emotional or metaphysical sort of detached from reality way that we use it all the time. A misunderstanding of love is actually the first problem we see in this text. But secondly, who is God? Who is God? Again, another small word and yet What a huge topic. What a huge topic. Well, you might say the the big guy, of course, right? The, The guy upstairs. Or somewhat of a dictionary definition, the supreme being. Well, okay, all of those things are like saying nothing, basically. They're not all that helpful when you get down to it. They're not all that specific. In fact, when you say God... When perhaps your priest says God, 
When your pastor says God, when your yogi says God, when your child says God, I suspect you all have something different in mind. We would do well to figure out what exactly John means when he says this. Further, we have a complication already in just this first phrase, the complication of merely saying it. Uh, the idea that it's the thought that counts, right? So husbands, how many times would you have to tell your wife, I thought of bringing you flowers home today for it to melt her heart? The first time you might get away with it, uh, but after that, there will be no positive effect. I can guarantee you that. The reality is, it's never only the thought that counts. Now, of course, more, most things begin with a thought. In that sense, the thought is necessary, it's essential. But if all it ever remains is a thought, then it's of little use, it's of little value. So this hypothetical person that John brings up, if anyone, or we might say if someone says, this hypothetical person clearly misunderstands both love and God because the very next phrase indicates that, right? Hates his brother. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, so this prompts another couple questions. And I realize I haven't given you any, any answers yet, but we're getting there. What is hate, right? Perhaps as nebulous as love. And who is my brother? Let's start diving in with this idea of hate. What is hate? At the very least, I think, given the context, it's the opposite of love, right? That's, we're getting somewhere when we say that, right? Love and hate, they're, they're opposites. That's good. That's pretty basic. The English dictionary says uh, hate is to feel intense or passionate dislike for someone or something. Intense or passionate dislike. Interestingly, John, in this book of 1 John, he uses this word five times, which for a negative concept and for a small book, that seems like quite a few to me. He uses hate five times, 1 John 2, 9 and 2, 11, 1 John 3, 13 and 15, and here in our passage, chapter 4, verse 20. However, uh, he doesn't, like most of us, he doesn't necessarily give the def definition of the word before he uses it, uh, but he comes close. In chapter 3, 15, we read this, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Okay, so that's about as close as he gets to defining what hate is for us. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Now, this is the same sort of thing that Jesus does in Matthew 5. If you remember Matthew 5, 28, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart, right? Right? Both Jesus and John here are using a form of hyperbole. Uh, neither of them is saying, John is not saying that if you hate your brother, you've actually killed him. Uh, and likewise, Jesus is not saying if you've looked at a woman lustfully, you've actually committed adultery. But they are both saying that you are actually guilty of those things, whether it be hate and murder or lust and adultery. Well, let's continue. Paul offers a little bit more help in Ephesians 5.29. He says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. So hate, then, uh, at least by way of another contrast, hate is the opposite of nourishing and cherishing. I think it's fairly clear, then, uh, probably our typical association with the word hate is accurate in this case. 
That does indeed seem to be what John is saying, that some sort of intense or passionate dislike for someone. When he says, hates his brother, I think that's what he's referring to. But it's important to note that he's not necessarily suggesting that you have to do something against your brother. Simply the thought is enough. Simply the thought of hating your brother or sister is enough to incriminate you. So who exactly is my brother? If hate is this intense or passionate dislike for someone, or you might say wanting the worst for someone, then who is my brother? Well, if you flip all the way back to Leviticus 19, Leviticus 19, the book that nobody reads, uh, but you all should, Leviticus 19 is where we first get the command, love your neighbor as yourself. And in that passage, verses 17 through 18 says this, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So as I hope you can see, Leviticus 19, 17 through 18 is actually addressing the same thing, really, that John is addressing here in 1 John 4. But with specific reference to who my brother is, it gives us some insight. In the case of the Israelites, their brother was defined as, what does the text say? Sons of your people, right? Or your neighbor. So really, it's, it's the fellow person in the covenant community. In the Old Testament, that would be those who chose to be a part of Israel and chose to follow the Old Testament law as God revealed it to them. In the New Testament, we would, we would consider this fellow believers, right? Uh, in fact, as I was praying, I just used that phrase, our brothers and sisters in Christ, so it's not necessarily to exclude everyone in the sense that you are, of course, supposed to love everyone, but John is not saying that. He's saying you are supposed to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Or in this case, you're not supposed to hate them. But we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> Two sides of the same cone, coin, perhaps. We read in 1 John uh, again, chapter 5, if you're in First John, just uh, cast your eyes down to chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, which says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. So again, with reference to brother, right, brothers are Children, brothers and sisters, are children of the same father. And in this case, if you claim God as your father, if you are indeed a child of God, then we are brothers and sisters. And that is who John is referring to here. Okay, so of these four difficult concepts, love, God, hate, and brother, I think we have a couple of them fairly well ironed out. The others will have to wait a moment, so keep those in your pocket. Verse 20 continues, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Note, John does not say, this person means well, but they're just a little bit off course. Uh, neither does he say, this person's well-intentioned, but they're wrong. Uh, he doesn't mince any words. He doesn't soften it at all. He says directly, he is a liar. It may be that in our culture, we have cheapened that word. We have softened that quite a bit. But that makes it no less bold in the case of John. Uh, see, I suspect when you see that word liar, your first thought is probably not Satan. Satan. But it ought to be. 
John 8, 44, so not 1 John, but now John, the Gospel of John 8, 44 says this. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and he says, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. See, John knows this. I can say that confidently because he wrote it. He wrote John and he wrote 1 John. He knows well. He was there, actually, when Jesus said this to the Pharisees. And what I think John is doing, actually, is applying the same thing Jesus said to the Pharisees to anyone who acts like a Pharisee, who says one thing and does another. If we make bold claims about our love for God, about how great we are, about how faithful we are, about how much we do for God, with no evidence, with no proof to back it up, then we are just like the Pharisees and, according to Jesus, just like Satan. We are a liar. Satan is the father of lies. John 8, 44, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. The reality is, friends, when we lie, we demonstrate that our character is the same as Satan's. When our actions demonstrate the opposite of our words, we demonstrate that our character is the same as Satan's. I think it's worth taking a moment to try to put that in your brain. Do you realize that if it were not for the devil, there would be no such thing as falsehood? There would be no such thing as white lies. There would be no such thing as half-truths. If it were not for Satan, there would be no such thing as lies. Now, of course, this hypothetical person that John's speaking of, he would never accede to this. He would never agree that he is a liar, right? He's just said, I love God. In the same way that you or I would probably never agree that we're a liar. You might perhaps admit that you've lied a time or two, but that's a world apart from acknowledging that you're a liar. Simply because you have a problem with another person? This passage suggests that yes, if you have a problem with another person, if you hate another person, then indeed you are a liar. I want to take just a moment to speak directly to parents, but with reference to everyone. Don't lie to your children. Don't lie to your children. It's fashionable. It actually is. But don't do it. It is perhaps the most destructive thing you can do. This is a little book, Apparent Privilege. Um, I recommend it. It's got a lot of great statistics in it. In fact, a lot of great surprising statistics. Uh, one thing he says here, an extensive study of 272,000 teenagers conducted by USA Today Weekend Magazine, so this is not, not a Christian publication by any means, or study, um, they found that 70% of teens identified their parents as the most important influence in their lives. Did you know that? Because if you're like most parents, which the next survey talks about, three out of four think that their kids don't care about their parents or that their parents don't matter. But the kids themselves, these are teenagers, mind you, they're not little kids, right? Uh, 70% say that their parents are the most 
influential people in their lives. So, I hope I don't have to make the connection too plain, but if you are the most influential person in your child's life and you consistently lie to your child, what do you suppose that does to them? If your actions consistently demonstrate something different than your words, what do you suppose that does to them? Do you suppose that's why an alarming percentage of supposedly evangelical children grow up, go to college, and lose their faith? Perhaps it's because their parents have been lying to them their whole childhood. Not overtly, right? I mean, again, no one's going to acknowledge that overtly. But white lies, lies, they're a result of our actions saying something different than our words. You see, the way that this applies to everyone is that when authorities in your life lie to you, you know what happens. Name the last politician that you trusted. <laughs> right? And I'll tell you why you shouldn't trust them. <laughs> When people in authority lie, and when they lie repeatedly, we're not stupid. Your children are not stupid. It's easy to figure out there's no reason to trust them. It's easy then to make the connection that there's no reason to trust any authority. Because authority just tells you what you want to hear, and then they go and do their own thing. So I plead with you, don't lie. Don't lie to your children. Don't lie to anyone under your authority. 1 John 2.22 says this, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. So we put these two passages together, 1 John 2.22 and 1 John 4.20. There's actually two ways to deny Christ. There might be more, but there's at least two ways to deny Christ. The first is by your speech. The first is by your speech. You simply say, I don't believe it. This is what's common outside of the church. But the second way is by your actions. You may say with your mouth, I love God, I believe God, but your actions demonstrate something completely different. And this is what's common inside the church. First John 4.20 continues. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So now we see a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes, if you will. See, simply saying, I love God, is easy because it requires no real world justification. It requires no flesh and blood. It requires no forgiveness. It requires no mercy. It requires no grace. It requires no long suffering or patience. In short, it requires no sweat. Furthermore, how hard is it really to say that you love the only perfectly lovable being in the universe? Jesus uses the same argument in Matthew 5. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Using the same argument in, in the narrowest sense of saying, I love God, it ought to be the easiest thing anybody could ever do. Because God is the only perfectly lovable being in the universe. And if it were just you and him, this ought to be cake. For you, anyway. You're still 
pathetic, rebellious jerk, but <laughs> it's easy for you to love God, not necessarily for God to love you. See, the trouble is God knows this to begin with, right? He knows all things. He knows how problematic it is of just saying something without providing any evidence for it. He knows that if you just say, I love God, essentially you're just saying that you love some sort of concept, some sort of idea. He, he realizes that the exercise is all cerebral, perhaps emotional, but it's not real. And furthermore, unless your concept of God is refined by the word of God, in the end, you will have been found to only be loving your imagination of God, your idea of who you think God is, not the real God. And those are indeed two different things. In his book, Orthodoxy, G.K. Chesterton, he hits the nail on the head when he says, we are not altering the real to suit the ideal. We are altering the ideal. It's easier. And he's exactly right. Whether it's God or love, it's easier for us to just change what they mean than to actually put it into practice. In other words, easy believism prevails. Easy believism prevails. Instead of keeping the mark high, like 1 Peter 1, quoting Leviticus, be holy as I am holy, we lower the bar to just below wherever we're at so that we're a winner. Everyone's a winner, right? The problem is, the problem is, it's not gonna turn out so well when you and I stand before God and according to Matthew 12, give an account for every careless word we utter. Not, not I mean, he, doesn't even say harmful or hurtful or mean words. He says every careless word that you and I utter, we will give an account to God for. That is not a low bar, friends. That is a high, high bar. So on the one hand, we have this first approach of saying it. On the other hand, we have a second approach. Those who do not merely say it but do it they provide the second approach, doing it. The second approach is doing it. Verse 20 says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And, verse 21, this commandment we have from him. And this commandment we have from him. It's worth taking a moment and asking, why didn't John say this suggestion we have from him? Why didn't he say this great example we have from him? Why did he not say this good idea we have from him? Because as we just sang, Christ is Lord. Christ is King. And kings give orders. Like it or not, that's the way it is. And this universe is a kingdom. It's not a democracy. I hate to break it to you. God is the king, and he gives commands. By him, this commandment we have from him, John means Jesus. The, way, the reason why he says it like this is because John is not referring to just the general bent of, of the scripture, which just Leviticus 19, the passage we read, right? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. John is referring to something specifically, something that Jesus said while he was in the flesh on the earth. And in particular, I think he's referring to John 13. So again, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. It says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is reinforced later in John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
So John is referring to what Jesus has already said, what Jesus said to the disciples, and by extension, anyone who claims to be his disciple. Our command is to love as Christ loved us. So verse 21 continues, and this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, whoever loves God. Now it's worth noting at this point that this is good news. Uh, it's actually possible to love God. It actually is possible to love God. Up until now, you've probably been thinking it's a, it's a remote chance, right? But it actually is possible to love God. So keep that in mind. Second, love. Love is not simply an idea. It's not simply an emotion. It's not simply some sort of metaphysical something sending good vibes your way. That's not it. In the words of DC Talk, love is a verb. Right? Love is a verb. Or in the words of Paul, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. That one's tough. It is irritable. It is not irritable or resentful. That one's tough. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Or in the scripture reading that we just had, Romans 13, owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So again, looking at contrasts, Paul would say love does no wrong to a neighbor, right? So you might say that's hate doing wrong to your neighbor. But love would be the opposite, right? Doing what's best for another person. Doing what's best for another person. And if I may, not what's best as they define it, and perhaps not even best as you define it, but what's best as God defines it. Third, God. God is not whoever you think he is. God is not whoever you think he is. God is who he has revealed himself to be. This is a crucial, crucial distinction. God is wholly other from us, and we know him only by his revelation of himself. Had he wished to remain hidden, he could have very easily done so. He just would have had to be quiet. And there would have still, I'm sure, been plenty of conjecture about who God is, about what he is, about where he is, but it would all be whatever we think. None of it would be what he has revealed the good news is he did choose to reveal himself. That's what the gospel is, good news. To the degree that your conception of who God is is refined by the Bible, it's accurate. To the degree that your conception of God is not refined by the Bible, it's inaccurate. It's really that simple. There's volumes upon volumes upon volumes about theology proper. Who is God? And yet the most important volumes are right here. You see, I cringe when people say, I just can't believe that God could send people to hell. Or referring to the Old Testament, I just can't believe that God would wipe out a whole nation. 
because whatever else may be wrong with those statements, they've not stopped to ask who God is. Their statement is based on their presupposition of who they think God should be, not of who God has revealed himself to be. Their struggles may be real. Those are real issues that are worth thinking through. But they've really failed to come to grips with the reality that God has revealed himself in the Bible, not in their heads. This indeed has gone much too far. David Wells, uh, you might call him a modern historian, commentator on the current state of things and how we got to where we are, he wrote a book called The Courage to be Protestant. It's an excellent book. He says, in the United States, 80% believe that a person should arrive at his or her own beliefs independent of any external authority, such as a church. Indeed, 60% say that since we all have God within us, churches are unnecessary. And in a generational slice that was made, 53% of boomers think it is more important to be alone and meditate than to worship with others. He says that the reason for this is that postmoderns trust direct experience but distrust what is mediated. That becomes a problem when none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. One. That's Romans 3. God is who he says he is in the Bible, not who you think he is. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother must also love his brother. Take note of that word, must, must. It's a necessity. Must also love his brother. The way we love God is primarily by loving our brother. The way we love God is primarily by loving our brother. This is right in line with the example of Christ. You see, if God had merely said, I love you guys, sincerely, God. <laughs> Despite all sorts of things that could be wrong with that, um, foremost among them is that there would be no evidence, there would be no proof that he loves us. Simply a note. But the reality is he chose to break into history and do something. He did something. He did more than one thing. There's a whole train of redemptive history starting in Genesis 3 that shows us how God has been relentlessly pursuing his children. And it culminates in the great condescension. It culminates in Jesus Christ becoming one of us. The Son of God, God himself, becoming one of his created beings. That's what we celebrate this time of year. The life of Christ, the perfect, sinless life of Christ, his death on a cross, and his resurrection, the first fruits of the resurrection. God has proven his love for us. God has proven it 
time and time again, and he's proven it ultimately in his son, Jesus Christ, and what he did for us. He did not simply say, I love you people. He said that, but then he did something about it, and he proved it. 1 John 4, 19, right before our passage, we love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. He's the first mover in this situation. So we see that for any, for anyone who says, I love God, for anyone that says, I love God, the burden of proof now rests upon your actions. It's easy for anyone to say, but the burden of proof now rests upon your actions. Just like God said, I love you, and he proved it by what he's done. There remains, uh, I can't believe I'm uh, referring to DC Talk twice in the same sermon, but uh, there remains emblazoned in my mind the prelude to one of their songs. Uh, the song is What If I Stumble? And the prelude is actually by Brennan Manning, who, uh, if you've read the Ragamuffin Gospel, he's the uh, author of that. He says this, I, you, you've probably heard this. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. As we've looked at 1 John 4, 20 and 21, there's two approaches that are described to loving God. The first one is simply saying it. The second one is doing it. Saying it and doing it. The first approach I hope you'll see is deficient. The first approach is useless. If that's all you've ever done is said it, it doesn't count. It doesn't count. And so I would encourage you, I would urge you today, take captive this day. Make the best use of the time. And rather than living for yourself, live for Christ. First John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. Did you hear that? If you're feeling burdened by what Christ has asked you to do, you ought not to be burdened, because there is his spirit who lives inside of you. If you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, enabling you to walk in new life, enabling you to love your brother and to not hate your brother, enabling you to forgive. There's a little book called Secret Power or The Secret Success in Christian Life and Work. It's by D.L. Moody. Um, it's an interesting little treatise. He makes a great statement he says, a great many are praying for faith. They want extraordinary faith. They want remarkable faith. Could be said in any time, probably, definitely in our time. They forget that love exceeds faith. The charity spoken of in the verses above is love, the fruit of the Spirit, the great motive power of life. What the church of God needs today is love, more love to God and more love to our fellow man. If we love God more, we will love our fellow men more. There is no doubt about that. I suspect he had read 1 John 4, 20 and 21. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. You say that you love God. You say it, 
church. Now prove it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you have broken into history. You broke the silence and you have shown us who you are. Without it, we would indeed be completely, utterly lost with no anchor, with no hope. And yet your revelation in the word of God has shown us that there is hope. It's not hope in ourselves. It's not hope in our works. It's hope in what your son, Jesus Christ, has done for us by his life, by his death on the cross, and by his resurrection. Lord, thank you for offering us new life. Thank you for offering us a restored relationship with you. Thank you that what you require of us, you also provide for us by your spirit. May we this morning, Lord, be encouraged to do what you have asked us to do, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, may that be the quintessential mark of this local congregation, that others may look in and see as plain as day our love for one another. May it be so compelling, Lord, that they want a part of it. They want to join. They want to see what's really going on in our hearts and in our lives. I pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.